Hello, my name is Corey Henson, and I'm one of the teaching assistants for instrumental analysis here in the chemistry department at Portland State University. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a laboratory method to detect corrosion using fluorimetry by detecting the quenching of luminescent carbon quantum dots when they interact with soluble iron ions. This is an experiment that I helped develop along with Dr. Lassiter Clare and the rest of her research group. This lab has been designed to incorporate current research being done by a faculty member into the teaching laboratory. This allows you to get a glimpse into what research looks like along with all the challenges and successes that come along with doing research. So first, I'm going to begin with some background information on what the Lassiter Clare lab is interested in. Dr. Lassiter Clare is interested in detection of corrosion before any signs of corrosion can be seen visually. Corrosion is a huge issue globally. Here in the United States, the 2013 corrosion costs were 3.1% of the gross domestic product, which was about $500 billion. Those $500 billion were used mainly to treat already corroded metal and for maintenance, not towards prevention of corrosion. Currently, most detection methods for corrosion rely on visual markers, such as an inspector noticing some rust. However, once the corrosion is visible, part of the metal has already been lost, weakening the metal structure. Thus, there is a real need for a method capable of detecting corrosion early before any signs of it can be seen. And hopefully, by detecting it early, researchers can develop materials that are resistant to corrosion better, either through more impervious protective coatings, the use of corrosion inhibitors, by new metal alloys, or mixtures of different metals and other elements that make the final material more corrosion resistant. For outdoor sculptures, there are three different types of metal that are of particular interest since they are the most commonly used materials. These three metals, steel, bronze, and aluminum, in addition to being used in sculptures, are also used in bridges, buildings, architecture, and aircraft, to name a few other important applications for this research. Each of these metals produce different corrosion products. The presence of different types of products poses one of the challenges in developing an early corrosion detection method. Ideally, there would be a single tool that could detect the corrosion products from all three metals. This tool could then be used by inspectors in a variety of situations to detect early corrosion. One strategy that Dr. Lassiter Clare and her students are developing is a method to evaluate the protective quality of coatings on outdoor metalwork, including paints and clear coats. When protective coatings start to fail, electrolytes can then penetrate to the substrate and start the corrosion process. Dr. Lassiter Clare is using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, shown here on the left, as a way to assess the permeability of coatings based on impedance measurements. In this experiment, we will not be using electrochemical impedance spectroscopy, but instead we are interested in developing a complementary method in which we will detect the presence of early markers or signs of corrosion to determine if corrosion is actually occurring and assess how much is occurring. It is her vision to use both techniques simultaneously, first to assess the protective quality of coatings, and then if the protective quality is questionable, to detect and quantify the amounts of transition metal ions present. Using two types of instrumentation, such as electrochemical and spectroscopic, would allow one to assess both the protective quality and corrosion markers on the same sample and possibly simultaneously. As seen in the image on the right, ideally there would be a tool that could be set on sculpture and produce a signal that scales based on the quantity of corrosion products present. One of the first tasks for me in thinking about developing this new tool was to turn to the primary literature and see what had already been done that might be helpful with our goals. We then found a promising paper by Chen et al. for a synthetic method to produce glowing or luminescent nanoparticles using citric acid. These nanoparticles are a specific type of particle known as a graphene quantum dot or GQD as it is labeled on the screen. Essentially, citric acid is heated and water is lost in order to form the quantum dots pictured on the screen. Upon further heating, the quantum dots will go through complete carbonization and form the graphene oxide sheet, shown on the right. For our purposes, we do not want to create the graphene oxide sheet, but rather the quantum dots themselves.
These dots are of particular interest because the research group on the next slide uses these dots to detect iron ions. This research group used the previous quantum dots to detect iron ions, but they incorporated nitrogen into the synthesis for the dots, which increased their sensitivity to the analyte. The detection of iron piqued my interest because iron ions are one of the early corrosion products for steel. Their synthetic method, as can be seen in the figure presented from their paper on the screen, started with citric acid and they get the same quantum dots that the previous research group got, as shown by the first arrow on the top there. They then nitrogen dope the dots using hydrazine. However, hydrazine can be very explosive, so for this experiment we are not interested in nitrogen doping the dots. Nitrogen doping the dots changes the homo-lumo gap, which helps the dots become more sensitive to iron, but it is not necessary for the detection of iron. The detection of iron is illustrated by the yellow balls binding to different sites on the quantum dots. Therefore, graphing quantum dots from citric acid will be used to detect early corrosion products from steel using this method. Once promising primary literature is discovered, those methods can provide useful starting points for projects. Reading the primary literature is also important to understand the current research in the context of previous work, related applications, along with the theory and background. Here's a bit of background for this project. The quantum dots both groups used are described as blue luminescent graphing quantum dots, and it is their luminescent properties that allow for iron to be detected. These quantum dots fit into a broader category of luminescent molecules, which includes fluorophores, such as Texas Red, shown here on the left. Texas Red is used for staining cells, as is shown in the figure on the right. Fluorophores are chemical compounds that can be excited by absorbing light and can then return to the ground state by emitting light, usually at a different wavelength than the one that was used for excitation. The end result of what quantum dots do is the same as a fluorophore. They absorb and emit light at a different wavelength. But exactly which wavelengths a quantum dot absorbs and emits is usually dependent on the size of the dots, as in the case for cadmium solenoid dots, which you can see based on this image here. With larger cadmium solenoid dots, there are more bonds, thus more orbitals, which narrows the homo-lumo band gap and reduces the energy of light emission, causing larger dots to luminous red and smaller ones to luminous blue. For the carbon quantum dots produced from citric acid, they are not tunable based on their size, which suggests that the mechanism by which they emit light is not based on the homo-lumo band gap, but rather on something else, possibly, it is the presence of chemically unique bonds called defect states. While the exact cause and mechanism of carbon quantum dot luminescence remains an interesting and ongoing topic in the literature, the end result is that these carbon quantum dots produce a blue luminescence, as seen in the image on the screen now, giving them the name blue luminescent carbon quantum dots. Now that we know it is possible to use blue luminescent graphene quantum dots to detect an early corrosion product from steel, it is important to understand how to measure these products using an instrument. After all, this is instrumental analysis. The instrument we will use to quantify fluorophores is called a fluorimeter. A fluorimeter is similar to a standard UV vis in terms that it is measuring the detection of photons through a sample. However, there are some major differences between the two instruments. In a fluorimeter, the detector is 90 degrees from the source instead of 180 degrees. The 90 degree angle is important because you really want to avoid the source directly shining into the detector. The light from the source is many orders of magnitude brighter than the luminescence from the dots. And so any stray light from the source would make it impossible to see any change in the emission intensity of the dots. Here you can see the block diagram where the source is coming in and the pass through monochromator which controls the excitation wavelength. The sample is then excited and emits light, which is measured 90 degrees from the source after passing through another monochromator. This monochromator controls the emission wavelength that is measured. These two wavelengths are very important for fluorescence. The excitation wavelength controls the energy levels of the incoming photons, while the emission wavelength controls where the detector measures the signal. Therefore, it is possible to run different combination of scans using a fluorimeter. For example, you can keep the emission wavelength constant while running a full spectrum of the excitation wavelength in order to determine the maximum wavelength.
Here is an example of what that spectrum would look like, and it can be seen that the maximum wavelength is right under 400, so that should be what the source is set at. However, you would also hold the excitation wavelength constant while scanning through the entire range of emission in order to collect a full spectrum of how the fluorophore emits light. Here is an example of what that spectrum would look like, and it can be seen that the maximum wavelength is right under 500. So that would be what the detector is set to look for. When the two spectra are overlaid on the same graph, you get a figure that looks like this. The two maxima are separated by a fixed distance of about 100 nanometers in this example. This distance is called the Stoke shift. The larger the Stoke shift, the bigger the separation between the excitation and emission peaks. Now that we have seen images of fluorescence and how a fluorometer works, it is important to understand how fluorescence takes place on the atomic scale. It can be seen in this Jablonski diagram that the electron gets excited to a higher energy state by the source of the instrument and then transitions back down to an energy state, but not the ground state. The electron absorbs some of the energy, which is why there is a Stoke shift. When the electron falls back down from the excited state, it fluoresces and allows us to use the fluorimeter to quantify its fluorescence. Now that you know what fluorescence is and how it is detected, the question is what happens to the fluorescence of the graphene quantum dots when iron is present. Here is an image of seven vials that have increasing concentration of iron from left to right. Hopefully you can tell that as iron concentration increases, the blue luminescence decreases. We can say the iron quenches or stops the fluorescence emission of these quantum dots. This amount of luminescent emission can be measured using the fluorimeter as seen in the image on the right. Why do the dots quench? Instead of releasing absorbed energy in the form of emitted photons, energy absorbed from the source must have been lost through non-radiated pathways such as vibrational modes, instead of by the fluorescence pathway. However, the exact pathways for the system are still debated in the literature. Quenching can be thought of like turning off the fluorescence when iron is present, with the more iron present, the more the fluorescence is turned off. There is a linear relationship that exists based on how much quenching takes place in relation to the original signal. This relationship can be plotted using the stern volmer equation, which is shown here on the screen. You take the ratio of the original signal over the quench signal in order to establish a linear curve. This equation then allows us to solve for unknown concentrations of iron, much like another calibration curve was used to measure unknown concentrations in the uv vis experiment. It also shows us the quenching constant, k sub q, or the slope of the equation. This relationship with known standards can then be used to detect low concentrations of soluble iron that exists as early corrosion products from steel samples. So how does this help with the global problem of corrosion? Because Dr. Lasseter Clare's lab is actively developing a methodology to detect the early signs of corrosion, through this lab you are helping to evaluate a methodology and the reproducibility of these experimental results. It is our hope that within a few years, methods similar to those they are using today will be used to detect corrosion on outdoor metalworks like sculptures and bridges. The samples that you will test in the lab have a range of conditions that we find on sculptures, including the case where no corrosion is visible by eye, yet is detectable by quantum dots. Myself and Dr. Lasseter Clare hope that in the near future, using data similar to that which you will produce, Maintenance staff will be able to determine if a sculpture needs to be entirely recoded, repainted in a specific damaged location, or whether nothing at all needs to be done. To prepare yourself to do the lab, you need to read the primary literature article cited, write an experimental procedure to make quantum dots, and describe how you will use the dots to detect iron that might be present as early corrosion products on test samples.